Good morning. God bless. It's great to be able to join together with you in prayer as we end this week. And even as we come, you know, close to the end of this year, God has really blessed us and helped us to navigate and survive and overcome some very, very difficult places. And so we're grateful today and thankful for you and your love and your support and your steadfastness in the will of God and the purposes of the Lord. I want to just thank God this morning and give him glory for who he is and all that he's done, just in our lives personally, but also throughout the world. For those who have eyes to see and ears to hear the ability from the Lord, it is obvious that God has just been so faithful to us and we're thankful for it, and we bless his name. Let's begin this time in prayer this morning, and you've got the glory and the honor that it's doing right where you are. I just encourage you to settle down, to settle in, to allow the Lord to just be the, the center and the focus that he is, to consciously focus upon the Lord and Be thankful to him. Bless his name is what the word says. Lord, we enter your gates as it speaks of in the scriptures um, with thanksgiving to your courts. We praise, we're thankful unto you. We bless your name this morning for you are worthy to receive glory, to receive honor. We thank you for your great love for us, Lord, and how you've shown us over and over and over again that you do love us, that you do care, that you have our best interests at heart, and that you have such a strong and tender affection for us, the longing in your heart is for that which is best for us. And although, Lord, we are allowed from time to time to go through things that or encounter things even that challenge that, we want you to know, Lord, that we hallow your name. You're worthy, Lord. Worthy to be praised, to be magnified and adored. There is none like unto you, God. And we bless you this morning. We thank you. We praise you. We revere you. We respect you. We honor you. We adore you. God, blessed be your name, Lord. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done in us. Thank you, Father God. Yes, Lord, we do yield to your rule and your reign in us. We thank you for being mindful of us, Lord, and for the truth of the word of God that remains faithful. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your righteous rule, your loving reign, for being over us, for being faithful to us, for being mindful of us. Great and merciful are you, our God. We thank you for the truth of the gospel and for the privilege of being able to hear the good news of the kingdom of God. We bless you this morning for that and how you have uh, called us into ministry and all of our different roles as kingdom citizens. We praise you for it. And Lord, we yield to you. We pray that you would teach us more about what that means to, to live in your kingdom, God. For it is not your desire that any should perish, 
but all should come into relationship with you in your kingdom. And so our heart's desire, God, today is, is that you that that you would help us to live in the kingdom in a way where the light is shining that you have given us and where we're like the salt of the earth that you spoke of and that many will want to know you. And Lord, as you've taught us to pray here, we pray that your kingdom would be manifested and that it would come forth uh, in our personal lives, Lord, that people would see that we're in it, but also that the desire that you have for this planet, this galaxy, this universe, all others, Lord, that, that the kingdom of God would be fully manifested here. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Your will be done, to God, in all of the earth, in every heart, in every home, in every neighborhood, as it is in heaven. Lord, even we just stop and think about uh, what heaven is, what it means, the kingdom of heaven, the rule and reign that's in heaven, the righteousness, the peace, the joy that's in heaven, the purity that's in heaven, the love that's in heaven, the patience that's in heaven, the steadfastness, that's in heaven. The long suffering that's in heaven. The goodness that's in heaven. The meekness that's in heaven. The harmony that's in heaven. Lord, we pray that all of these virtues would be manifested in us, even as it is in heaven the truth that's in heaven, the purity that's in heaven, the holiness that's in heaven. Let it come forth in us. The glory that's in heaven. We want it, O oh God, the hope, the expectation that's in the heart of the Father that's in heaven. Let it let it come forth in us, God. In the name of Jesus. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. As it is in heaven. Lord, we know that there are no violations to your will in heaven. And we long, Lord, for we long for that day. When that's when it will be on earth. That's the way it will be on earth. Your will be done. May it be so, Father. We crave it. We long for it. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. I just encourage you this morning to think about that. What what life is really like in the dimension that Jesus taught us to pray for. The word tells us that you know shows us in the book of Revelation, other passages in Daniel and that um, in that dimension that there's there's total peace, there's praise, there's worship, 
unceasing in terms of time, of course, and that not to mention there there will be quote no time, but but the, just could you imagine that you know, an existence where the rule and the reign of God is is totally welcomed, where there is no resistance, none whatsoever, to the righteousness of God, the peace of God to the joy of God, to the perspective of God. I know we try to live like that down here, right? And there are times when it's just so obvious, not only in other people, but in our own hearts where there's this tug of war going on. You know, the maturer we get in God, the less we allow that tug of war to go on. The more we grow, the more we learn, the more we yield that tug of war, we're more successful over it. And we're thankful to God today for his goodness, his mercy, and his grace that helps us to do that. Isaiah 26 says, open the gates, verse 2 a prophecy to the nation of Judah about their return and, and their uh, life in the kingdom beyond, you know, this period of time. So it's open the gates so a righteous nation can come in. One that remains faithful. You will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace. For it is trusting in you. This is, you know, we, we get the opportunity to live in the earth as models of that kingdom that is coming. In a sense, it is here. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. But he also taught us to pray for it to come. Is that a contradiction? No, it's, it's to help us to see that what we experience now what we're living in now, what we're being exposed to now, it's only the the foretaste of that which is to come. There's a longing and a yearning in us. Someone wrote a book called that yearning for Eden. There's a longing and a yearning for in us for paradise. People that aren't aware or that are skeptical sometimes about God, the Bible, as we present him, even as he's presented himself, and as we present it, the word of God, um, convinced that they're right and that we are wrong, uh, they just they would interpret that longing and that yearning in us as just a natural desire for things to be better than they are. But it's deeper than that, right? It's 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 more than that. It's not just a desire for things to be better. Though we do desire for things to be better, it is a desire for things to be as God wants them to be. And Jesus taught us that one of the things that God wants to be, the Father wants to be, is that his kingdom would be yielded to, submitted to all over the world, all over the universes. In the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. And it's his desire. Isn't that amazing that God would desire his kingdom to be manifested throughout the earth. How is the mind kept in perfect peace? This particular version, I love it, says you will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace. Is your mind dependent on the Lord is it, is it 
willfully? Are you willing to be dependent on the Lord? I know that uh, Paul says that the nine tendency because of sin resists the things of the spirit. He called it being carnally minded. Carnal minded. I was growing up, I used to hear it. You know, my mother and dad and even sometimes folks in church say, don't be carnal-minded. And I thought, what in the world is that? What does it mean to be carnal-minded? The word means to be fleshly ruled or to live by the the desires and the passion and the determinations of that part of our human nature that is unaided by the presence and the wisdom and the love of the Spirit of God. That's a mouthful, but it means to live by that. And it, it, to be carnal minded it means to have the, the understanding or to live by an understanding that it does not come from God. Which means we go with how our body feels, what our body longs for. At times when it's it's longing for things and yearning for things and expressions that are not pleasing to God. Now, since God made us human, there are some longings and yearnings that are, I don't want to just say natural, but they are they are normal. They are um, even more than normal. They are acceptable to God because he made us that way. But then there are some longings, there are some yearnings, uh, there are some ways of thinking. The Bible talks about being natural-minded. It doesn't mean that it's okay. It means that it's a, it is an understanding that that is not okay with God. It lacks God's input. It lacks God's insight. It is often opposed, as Paul writes in Romans 8, it's opposed. To God, it's that enmity with God that means hostility. To be calmly minded, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this. To be calmly minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we learn from the word that carnal-mindedness is dangerous and deadly. Spiritually minded is not just enjoyable, it's healthy. What does it mean to be spiritually minded? It means that we are under the government intentionally living our lives yielded and under the government of the Holy Spirit. We live according to the understanding the Holy Spirit gives us through the Word of God and we live according to the empowerment of the energy of the Holy Spirit. It seems like a lot in that one, in the answer to that one verse, but that. Scripture says, you will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed. That's the old King James Version, the version that I learned when I first learned that version. With, you know, learning that scripture, this version reads, the one who's dependent, the mind is dependent, the thoughts, 
the understanding is dependent on you. Is your mind dependent, willfully dependent on God? Or is it something you resist? Do you live, Paul says that the uh, the word of God says in Romans chapter 7, that we, we, by nature, by nature, or naturally speaking, we, we're resistant. That's, that's until you get saved. And then when you get saved, there is a, there is this tug of war going on inside. It's kind of like, a, we, we don't completely shed that part of, of, of what it means to live in Christ. It's like there's this, well, he just said, he said, my, there's a war against the law of the principle of the nature in which I think. And then in chapter 8, he calls it being carnal-minded. So I find that there's a war in, the, in my mind in, in my in my thinking, in my reasoning, in my analyzing. It's not until we are standing, so to speak, or we we're, we've we've left this dimension and we're now living fully in the presence of God to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. It's not until then that we will be completely freed of that struggle. But until then, we can live in mastery over it. And one of the ways is to is is to completely, by faith, by grace through faith, Yield to what God says. Be totally dependent. Let let the understanding and the point of view that we that we get be totally dependent upon the Lord. What does that mean to be dependent upon the Lord? When you're born into the world, even prior to being born, your physical body is dependent upon your mother. Your birth mother. That's before you're born. She dies, you die, unless they get you out in time and somehow. Even after you're born, you're dependent upon the care of your mother, your father, your. If you're in a hospital somewhere, you upon those who. Provide that care. So first there's utter dependence. And then there's a kind of codependence. You're dependent upon them. You need them. You need the, the, the nutrients that's in your mother's body, in the milk. You need the nurturing that she will provide, you need the nurturing of nurses and medical teams and the expertise you need, the provisions that would come to your father, him holding you and praying for you and caring for you, going to work and providing what's needed. You're dependent. And you don't even know to be you're born into a dependent state. As you grow and learn, you're dependent on learning them to learn who you are, your identity and what you're to do and how to do what you need to do to eventually you know, hold your bottle, hold your head up <laughs> To sit up. Yeah, you're dependent. And in like manner, we're dependent on God 
the deal is. So we we never go out of that dependence. In time, we learn to be a little independent. But that isn't the ideal state. We learn to be interdependent. Where we function in a state of dependence in a healthy way upon God and upon others. A person who is just determined never to need anyone or never to depend on anybody. Sometimes that that attitude comes out of a a place of uh, great pain and struggle where people have abused or misused us in some way. They've hurt us. they betrayed us. We were dependent. We acknowledged that we were really needing them and their help. And they betrayed us. They abused. And so you just kind of decide you will never, ever be in that place again. The truth be told, yeah, you will. It's the way God has designed life. We're to love one another. We're to care for one another. We're to be of one heart, one soul. We can never, or should never, should say we can never, because sometimes we are, we do do it. But we should never depend upon another human being like we depend upon God. Right? That should never be the case. But. Uh, We do. The word depend means requiring someone or something for financial, emotional, or other support. To depend is a very important thing. And God made us so that we would depend upon him in a way like we depend on nobody else. Yeah. Where where if he doesn't I wanna say do, but if if we don't draw from his very nature like a baby in a mother's womb, there's no way in the world we can survive. And I don't just mean in the sense of being saved I mean, in the sense of growing and developing. God uniquely releases what we need directly to us. But sometimes he will involve other people in that process so that everything is really, all things come from thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. It's one verse of scripture. And the Bible says, everything good and perfect comes from God. It's from the Lord through people. And so when we say, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done, we we we, we mean this, Father. We, we want what comes from you. We want perfect shalom. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind, yes, sir, is stayed on you. you. You're there. Perfect peace. Mine stayed on the Lord. Stayed on the Lord. Stayed on the Lord. Stayed on the Lord. You will keep us in perfect peace. Oh, uh, how we need God today. This one and only special way we need Him. We need him. Would you say that to God just before we go today, Lord? I I need you and I choose to be willfully dependent on you. Come on, tell him. I choose to be willfully dependent upon you. Let's 
some versions read it like this. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. That's the New Living Translation. English Standard Version says you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Because he trusts in you. Yeah. It's a good thing. You will keep in that's that word shalom. Completeness, soundness, welfare, peace. Do you know things don't have to always be without error, without sin in your life for you to be at peace and soundness? Everything doesn't have to be perfect around you for you to be sound, whole, sound in mind, sound in body, for you to and me to be prosperous. That's what that is about. Tranquil, commit, content. You know where that contentment and that soundness really comes from? Your thoughts, your emotions, your will, being focused and leaning upon and trusting in the Lord. As we come out of this time today, I really want to say some other things, but we're out of time. I, I just I just believe that that's really what God wants. That's the conviction I have as we're praying this morning about his kingdom being manifested in us in this way where we are willfully acknowledging that we're dependent. We're not tugging and not wanting to be dependent on God. So if God knows I'm already dependent on him, that's the wrong kind of attitude. It's kind of like you're stuck. You really don't want to be. If you could do it any other way, you'd do it another way. But because you're stuck, you're acknowledging it. No, 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 we don't. He doesn't want us to be that way. He wants us to be joyfully, wholeheartedly dependent upon him because we trust him. We trust him. Do you trust him? I mean, for real, though. <laughs> I'll end with this. The word for trust means we rely on him. I've been teaching that for years, and I have to do it like everybody else. It means that we are without care. And amazing. We're confident. See, we're confident in him because we know him or we're getting to know him. Nobody knows God to the point where they can't learn more. But it means that we're getting to know him. And the more we see in him his character, his nature, not just his actions, but his character. See, his character is what wins us over. The one fundamental thing about God that we need to know is that he loves us. Galatians tells us that uh, faith, in this case, trust, works by love. Faith is, is not something that we walk in based upon only how we feel. It's based upon what we know about God. You do not trust everybody that you love. You start out doing it, but you, you, you discover you can't trust, you can't fully rely upon and be confident and, and carefree with everybody you have affection for, everyone that you're committed to walk in a way and for their best. You trust to the degree that you know you are loved 
you rely, have confidence, only to the degree that you are convinced that you are loved, that the person that loves you or says they love you has demonstrated that they have your total best interest at heart and they have acted in that way. Those are the people you trust. How much more should we trust God? While we were sinners, Christ died. The ultimate price was paid for our ultimate good. Without us demanding it, even when we didn't know it was being paid or had been paid, he did it anyway. That's love. And so as we close this morning, Father, we 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 I pray and we pray together that you'd show us even more your perfect love. It prompts us. It tugs on our heart. It compels us to trust you and to live our lives unto you who died and rose again for us. But for him, we live, move, have our being. Lord, there's so much, so many moving parts around us, so many things going on around us. We, it's so easy to get distracted. And I confess, Lord, that even though I've walked with you these years, it's so easy. You still have to remind me that you love me, that you're concerned, that you have my best interest at heart. And I thank you for reminding me. It helps me to trust you. And when I trust you, I know you're going to work all things for your good. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We can forgive those who still owe us. Thank you for it, because you've, you've done that with us. You've released us. You've canceled debts in our lives. We thank you that you're enabling us to do it. We trust you, Lord, that when we do it, you're going to minister your grace in the lives of those that so desperately need to be freed from the arts and the grudges that we've allowed to form in our hearts against him in anger, in pride, in fear. Lead us not into temptation. Be delivering us from evil, for, for you are our only deliverer. And, Lord, yet we are not panicking because you are our only deliverer. We trust you. All this stuff screaming at us, that we look the deadlines, the bills, and the threats of death to our physical bodies, death to our relationships, death to everything around us, everything that's terroristically trying to ride us, we say in the midst of it, we trust you. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked encamp around us. In this will I be confident. <laughs> You're my light. You're my salvation. You're our shepherd. You lead us beside still waters. We have no need. We have no lack. You Comfort my soul. You lead us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Yes, though we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. For you are with us. You're not idle. You're not just there, though that would be good enough. You prepare a table before me in the presence of our enemies. You know, our heads with oil, our cups run over. Surely goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life. We will dwell in the house of the Lord 
forever. Yes, 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 yes. You rebuke the devourer, Akirish, for our sakes. So we bring no reeling accusation against the enemy, except to say, the Lord rebukes you. But Lord, <laughs> the one and only true God, Jehovah, Yahweh, Elohim, El Shaddai, the sub of his name. Oh, my God. We worship you today. We bless you now. How small these things seem that threaten us, for they cannot override you and your word over us. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on, join with me now. Bless him. Praise him. Honor him. Lift him up. Extol him. It's just a matter of time before you see the full manifestation of his word, the healing of your body, the deliverance of your mind, your emotions, your will, the answers to every prayer, every petition, relax in him, bless him, honor him. Great and mighty are you, God. Great and mighty are you, Lord. We love and adore you. We bless you, Father. We worship you this day. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in us. Whatever you're teaching us by allowing us to be in this place of hardship, of waiting, we're starting to get it. You can't force us to trust you, but we choose to trust you here. Hallelujah. There is really no other viable alternative but to trust you, God. Thank you, Jesus. And so our minds are willfully stayed upon you, dependent upon you. We acknowledge this dependence and we reject every temptation to regret it, to regret having to depend upon you. We delight in knowing you and serving you. As we walk throughout this day, we pray, Lord, that this dependence would become more normal and more natural in peace. It's a joy to serve you. It's a joy to be dependent upon you. You never disappoint us. Goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life. We pray that as we gather later to Express some of your goodness and some of your kindness to those who will be coming through with their needs for food and other things that we're able to supply. At this time, when we remember your coming into the earth, though we know that it probably wasn't this time of year, but in solidarity with that which you birthed in the in your church to stand up against understanding about you, views of you that was just ungodly, demonic, satanic, a worship that was just impure and unholy. We worship you as the wise men of the East. We bring our gifts. They brought gold, incense, and myrrh, speaking of your deity and of your priestly role and your death and your resurrection. We bring our gifts with testimonies to the same, that you are God in the earth, in us, through us. You live in us. We are God, but you live in us. And so we worship you. Emmanuel, God with us. Be glorified in these temples, individually and in this one collective temple. We bless your name. I pray that you'd minister this word. We won't have time to say all of that. Minister your peace. May people not just go with mankind's humanly produced understanding and sense of peace. May they be exposed to the peace of God. And the moment you give us to share it. I pray that many would discover 
and enter into the peace that you want them to have through Christ. For your word says you've called us into peace, not the peace that the world gives, but the peace only you can give. Be glorified, Lord. Well, Lord, bless you, brothers and sisters in Jesus. Thank you for listening and for being a part of this special time. As we end this week, I encourage you to come, be a part of the day. We ask the Lord for his favor. And even as we gather together tomorrow, his protection and his peace in every dimension that many will come to know. And also be willfully dependent upon the Lord and kept in this unmistakable wholeness, prosperity, victory, his peace. God bless. Have a wonderful day today.